Hello, in this video we are going to be looking at our second theory of perception, that of representative or indirect realism. There are three uh, philosophers that you need to um, talk about in relation to representative realism. The first is John Locke, the second is David Hume, and the third is Bertrand Russell. Now, um, I'm not going to cover everything um, on Hume in this video, um, but I will return to themes in representative uh, realism when I look at Hume's empiricism. So, let's make a start. John Locke, as I say, develops indirect or representative realism, and he basically argued that we learn of the world through our sense perceptions that are constructed from sense data. These sense data are caused by the mind-independent world. And Locke makes a famous distinction that you all need to know about between primary and secondary qualities that I will come to in more detail later. Um, but for the time being, um, primary, the distinction between primary and secondary qualities can explain how perceptions vary between individuals. Now, this is not something that direct realism was able to cope with as an argument. So let's first look at this idea of representative realism and visual impressions. So, perceiving an object obviously involves having certain visual impressions, otherwise we wouldn't be able to actually see the object at all. And I can describe these to others, but only I have access to them. In other words, I can describe my experiences of colour uh, and so on, and, and indeed of pain or anything that comes through sound as well, through hearing. I can describe um, these ideas or these perceptions rather to others but really only I've got access to them in other words only I can know how they are for me right other people obviously have experiences too um, but I cannot know the quality of their experiences any more than they can know the quality of mine um, there are however sometimes differences that become obvious for example, someone normally sighted and somebody red-green colourblind looking at a series of red-green objects will see different things. And that is a difference in representation. Right? It's a difference in how the world is represented to those two people. So we can conclude from that, from both those arguments, that the mind-independent world is represented to me by my senses. And perhaps uh, a few um, pictorial uh, illustrations will demonstrate this. So this is the famous duck rabbit. Um, some people will see it as a duck, some people will see it as a rabbit, and some people will see it as both. It sort of flicks between the two. All right. However you see it, it is how your senses represent that picture to you. I'll give you another one. Okay, this one's slightly more difficult. So this is the old young and young woman. Some of you may only be able to see the young woman, some of you may only be able to see the old woman, and some of you may be able to see both. But I think in this case, more of you will be able to just see one of the figures. It might just be the old woman, it might just be the young woman. Again, the fact that we, we can see different things shows that our senses represent the mind-independent world to us differently. Okay, And so this is how um, Locke believes our senses are represented to us. So we can note in the case of both the duck rabbit and the old lady that there's nothing in the external world that has caused me to see the drawing differently to you, right? The drawing remains the same. Um, if I'm one of those people who suddenly comes to see the other, the other aspect of the picture, if you like, so if I'd only ever seen the rabbit and now suddenly I come to see the duck, nothing actually in the drawing has changed. What has changed is something in my visual experience. All right, and those of you, for those of you who are interested in this area, um, the Gestalt psychologist Wolfgang Kurler, um wrote a book called Gestalt Psychology uh, in which he explores these ideas. So the object itself does not change, right? um, and if I, were to, if I were to draw the same thing, if let's say I drew the duck rabbit, or, uh, when I could only see it as a duck, and I drew it as accurately as I could, when I then come to see it as a rabbit, I'm still forced to draw the same thing, because the object has not changed. Okay, So the conclusion, as I say, is I see these figures as they are represented to me by my mind. 
Here are some further examples. Now, some of you may see this particular picture as moving. I can assure you it's not. Okay, so again, it's how your senses represent the external world to you. Similarly, again, this one, you may see as moving, you may not. Um, but the difference, the differences are really just down to the person doing the perceiving, not the object itself, which I can assure you is not moving. So let's now look at an important distinction within representative realism. That is the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Now Locke divided these qualities um, into three types, but overall it's, it's, it's a distinction between two ideas. All right? So there are the primary qualities of an object, such as solidity, uh, extension, motion, and so on. Okay? Anything that has a size, must also have a shape. So these are two primary qualities of an object. Anything that exists as a physical thing must have a size and a shape. By contrast, secondary qualities um, are those things that we see but that are not necessarily properties of the object itself. Okay, And these can be divided into two groups. The first group of secondary qualities are those things that we perceive, such as colour, taste, sound, and smell. All right? Colour and taste, we do not know whether they are intrinsic to the object itself or not. Okay? And Locke's opinion is that colour and taste are both ways in which physical objects affect our senses and cause us to perceive them in certain ways. Okay? So the way that a physical object is may cause us to see it as a particular colour. You know, it reflects certain light wavelengths, for instance, and our senses represent light wavelengths to us as a particular kind of experience, for example, the colour blue. Similarly, um, if we taste um, an object, a bit of food, for example, um, the taste is the result of the effect that that particular physical object has on our senses. And the same goes with sound and smell and so on. The second group of secondary qualities are powers, all right? And um, this is the idea that a physical object has the power to affect something. For example, the ability of the sun to bleach colour out of a newspaper, for instance. And from this, Locke develops his causal argument. So the primary qualities of an object have a particular effect on our senses. And these senses relay information to the brain, which then represents us, represents that information in the form of sense data. Okay, so the primary qualities of an object cause us to experience those objects in certain ways. So the, they cause secondary qualities. And it's through this causal argument that Locke justifies the existence of a mind-independent world which exists in a causal relationship with our perceptions. So our perceptual apparatus can only be affected in particular ways because of the kind of apparatus it is. Thus, our senses represent the world to us rather than allowing us to see it directly. Hence, representative realism. Okay, so it's the kind of apparatus that we have, such as eyes and ears um, and taste buds and so on, um, that allow us to see the world and, and experience it in a particular way. But it's the apparatus itself is what determines how, how we do so. Okay? As I've mentioned in the video on direct realism, other animals perceive the world differently. For example, the bird at Kestrel, which is a small bird of prey, can actually see ultraviolet as a colour. Um, to human beings, it's invisible. So obviously that raises the question about... Um, correctness of perception. How do I know that um, human beings see the world correctly? Or how does the Kestrel know that it sees the world correctly? It, it's just perhaps that we perceive things differently. Uh, it's just about how our perceptions represent the world to us. Now Bertrand Russell, Russell has a, a version of indirect realism of his own that is obviously informed by John Locke's ideas. Um, in chapter 3 of The Problems of Philosophy, for example, Russell argues that ideas we have, such as light, are things that we immediately see. But the physics that causes us to perceive light, which he describes as a kind of wave motion, is something quite different and something that we do not see. In other words, the wave motion 
is interpreted by our perceptual apparatus in a way that allows us to experience it as light. Okay, So we can easily describe wave motion to a blind person, Russell thinks, but this is not actually what we mean by light. Light is an experience that someone has when they're not blind because the wave motion has that particular effect on the senses that gives that person then the experience of light. Okay, So Russell says, when it is said that light is waves, what is really meant is that waves are the physical cause of our experience of light. Now, indirect realism or representative realism can lead to scepticism as a result of these arguments. So a substantial problem is that if there's no good reason to believe that the world is exactly as we see it, then there seems reason to believe that the world is represented to us in a way that might not be as it actually is. All right. So, as you should know, scepticism is the philosophical view that there is good reason to doubt that how we apprehend the world, how we perceive it, is how the world actually is. Now, representative realists are not global sceptics, okay? They don't believe that we cannot know anything except the contents of our own mind, but they do believe that there is at least some doubt about whether what we see is an accurate representation of the world, and as such, how, whether or not we can know that world correctly or not. So they, the sceptical argument is that we may not, as a result of our representations, be able to grasp the external world correctly and then of course the question is how would we know whether what we're seeing is right or not so it leads to that kind of skepticism moreover if we think about this argument in relation to the distinction that Locke draws between primary and secondary qualities we know that secondary qualities are how our senses are affected by objects in the external world but there's no way of establishing whether or not this representation is accurate and while Locke appreciates that this can lead to a certain degree of scepticism about the external world, so how can we know that the external world exists as I see it? He does provide an argument against what's known as global scepticism, and this is the idea that we might know nothing but the contents of our own minds. So his argument for global scepticism is essentially intended to show that there's a mind-independent world, even if we can't know that that mind-independent world is represented to us accurately. And he puts it like this, there are some perceptions that we can control ourselves. For example, we can choose which part of the room to look at and thus choose both the order in which we perceive things and what we perceive. OK, so if you move your head and look at one part of the room, you know what's in that part of the room. OK, so you know what you're going to perceive and you know the order in which you're going to perceive it when you turn your head. However, there are also some perceptions that we cannot control. For example, trees moving in the wind, people walking past us, and so on. So there must be something that causes the perceptions we cannot control that is beyond our control. Therefore, there must be a mind-independent world. And this seems quite a sort of convincing argument. Russell makes a similar argument... He says that sense data are the immediate sensations we have and from which we perceive things. So, as you know, colour, uh, taste, shape, and so on. And although we can't prove that physical objects are the cause of our sense data, it is the best explanation on offer. In other words, uh, the, the right way of phrasing this, this would be inference to best possible explanation. All right. Um, so we're including the, appar the apparatus itself such as the eye and the brain, in terms of physical objects, uh, which are respectively affected by wave motion and perceived as light. OK, so the eye is affected by the wave motion, and that wave motion, the information that the eye then sends to the brain, is then interpreted in a particular way. It's perceived as light. So a cat exists as a physical object. We perceive it as a furry, warm, soft animal, and so on. Um, but the problem... The still affecting the sceptical problem is that we are still only acquainted with the sense data. We're not really properly acquainted with the object itself. OK, 
Okay, so this is what's known as the veil of perception, and both um, Locke and Russell consider this to be uh, something that uh, can't be overcome. So they both believe in this veil of perception. The veil of perception being that we are essentially behind our, cons our um, sensory apparatus, sight, hearing, and so on, and that these representations are not obviously us having direct, ob um, direct access to the objects themselves. All right? So it's the veil of perception. Right, that's a brief but I hope useful introduction to representative realism. I will return to topics in representative realism when we look at empiricist ideas. Okay, that's the end of this video.